Thank you very much. When, when the introduction is, is so elegant, I want the introduction to just go on and on. Um, it, was, it, was, it was lovely. Thank you very much for being here. In being here, you, you helped me to alleviate some of the concerns which I'm about to share with you. And in being here, you are already taking part in some of the things which I would like to advocate for. So before I begin, I, I want to thank you for coming out, for not looking at a screen, for taking part in a conversation. And I mean that in all earnestness. Thank you. So I don't know whether you're going to applaud me at the end or not, but I will begin by applauding you. Thank you. <laughs> Cultures and exchange. I have 25 minutes. I'm going to share with you what I think is most important. What I think is most important is trying to understand the strangeness of it all, trying to understand how we can be where we are now. Because the problem is not just a trend. Of course, we can all observe a trend. We know that for the last 10 or 12 years, around the world, democracy has not been advancing, but retreating. We know that according to very important measures, public opinion polls, democracy is less important in our own countries than it once was. But this isn't simply a trend. It's also what we're experiencing is also a series of surprises. The arrival of the uncanny, the unheimlich, the things that we not only didn't expect, but couldn't have expected because they are so strange. The election of Donald Trump is an idea which did not fit into the minds of people in the very recent past. The departure of Great Britain, a major European Union member, is an idea which would have seemed odd not so very long ago. And underneath these events are stranger events still. Fictions now take a good deal of the space in political discussion. Uh, fictions that are neither small nor big, they're no longer the big lie of the 1930s, but they're not the small lies that people tell every day either. They're medium-sized lies. Obama was born in Africa as a Muslim. Russia shot down a Polish airliner with the president aboard. Russia did not shoot down MH17 right? Medium-sized lies, I just told three, which fundamentally affect political discourse in important countries. Hillary Clinton is a pimp who sells sex with children. One-third of the American population, when polled, believe that to be true. These are lies which don't build up to a worldview, but these are fictions which change the character of political conversation and help change the character of politics itself. And what is this globalization that we're taking part in? Certainly things are globalized, but globalization itself does not lead towards progress, understanding, enlightenment at all. The internet certainly does not lead towards progress, understanding, enlightenment at all. Not on its own terms. These last 12 years, when internet penetration has extended to the majority of the world population, have been a total disaster for democracy and human rights around the world. And that is not a coincidence. So we are in a globalization, but the globalization is in many ways dark. The way I'd like to think about this now and then later with Shalini's help is in terms of what comes before politics. How do we experience life? What are the things that are in our minds that reach us before we start to think about politics? For me, and perhaps it's because I'm a historian, I will own up to that, one of these very important things is time. How do we think about time? I think that what is happening to us is that we're shifting from one idea of time to another. And I'd like to take a moment to try to explain this idea because ideas of time are so important 
that they're all embracing. We live within them, and they affect how we see outside. They're like a bubble or like a filter, right? They determine what we see and what we don't see, what we think is possible and what we think is not possible. And when these ideas of time break, then we're at a kind of turning point, which is, I think, where we are now. One idea of time, which has been very powerful in the West for the last 25 or 30 years, is what I would call the politics of inevitability, right? The politics, unausweichlichkeit, the politics of inevitability. The notion that time is a line, it's leading from the present into the future. We know what's going to come next. Everything is progress. The good things we have now, we'll just have more of them in the future. Everything that is good is measurable. And let us give you measurements to tell you how, despite appearances, everything is going to turn out well in the end. These are the politics of inevitability. The facts will be edited to make sure that there's a happy ending. We know there's going to be a happy ending. There are no alternatives to that. This idea breaks. And it is breaking now. It's breaking in different times and places. It's breaking in people's minds for different reasons. But it is breaking. It's breaking all across the West. It's breaking in the over-globalized Midwest of the United States. It's, it's broken already in Russia. It's breaking before our eyes. And when it breaks, it tends to give way to another idea of time, which I call the politics of eternity, Ewigkeit. The politics of eternity says, Ah, time is not a line into the future. It's a cycle. The same thing happens over and over again. And really, only one thing has ever happened to us. Because in the politics of eternity, it's all about us. Only one thing has ever happened to us, and that is our victimhood. The outsiders come over and over and over again, posing a physical and indeed a sexual threat and that is the only thing that we must think about as we identify ourselves. In this set way of seeing the world, not only is there no progress, there is no future at all. The future disappears from the screen. Politicians and governments stop talking about the future. Um, instead, they talk about the way things happen over and over and over again. All is not progress. All is defense. The future doesn't exist. What matters now is not what you can quantify, it's how you feel, or how I can make you feel, or how the internet can make you feel, or how a president who hits you over and over and over again with the Twitter can make you feel. The way the politics of eternity works is that it weds ideas about threats that return from the past, a historical cycle, with a postmodern technological cycle, which makes it very hard for you to think because you're being hit regularly over and over again with the idea that you should be free, that you should be afraid, that you should be anxious. Have you noticed how often the word fear appears now in journalism, in the internet, in the conversations with your friends, right? Why is that exactly? So by unfreedom, I mean something new. I mean the shift from inevitability to eternity. What we see on the surface is the collapse of democracies, the collapse of rule of law states, the rise of new forms of authoritarianism. But what I'm trying to be concerned about here is what's going on underneath. Let me try to be clearer by giving you an example. This is an example you're going to like, because this is the part where I criticize the United States of America. So you already like it, and I haven't even started. But don't worry, I'll come back around to you. So. What is the politics of eternity in the United States? The politics of eternity in the United States says communism came to an end. History, therefore, came to an end. There are no alternatives. Capitalism will bring democracy. No, there's nothing that any of us as individuals, as citizens, have to do. Wall Street became Marxist. Economics determines politics. We know the political future because we know the economic present. Okay. What happened, in fact, in the United States over the course of the last 20 years is that we became institutionally a less democratic country. We became socially a much more unequal country. 
Um, and we became a country where, after the shock of 2008, it became very difficult for people, or for many of my fellow citizens, to think that the future was coming, or to think that the future was going to be better than the present. And of course, we know what comes next, right? We know that the America of 2016 is a country which is institutionally less democratic, socially more unequal. It's also a country where the average citizen spends 11 hours a day in front of a screen. It's also a country where a serious proportion of the population is addicted to opioids, which is another way of experiencing time as a cycle. If you're addicted to anything, and to drugs like heroin in particular, life is a cycle over and over and over again. And I mention this not by chance. The single, strong, the single strongest predictor of a vote for Donald Trump in the United States was you live in an area where there is a public health crisis involving opioids. Right? So that's the United States as it actually is. The interesting thing about the 2016 election is the synergy, and I choose the word carefully, the synergy with Russia. It's very important for Americans not to look at Russia and say, oh, that is a foreign distant land that is completely unlike us and has attacked us. Sure, they attacked us, but why did the attack succeed? And this is an uncanny thing. It's not every four years, at least not so far, that Russia gets to choose the President of the United States, right? This is something new. It's something that Americans have trouble getting their minds around. It's exactly the sort of brute factuality that one certainly would prefer to have illusions about instead. But nevertheless, it's clearly the case. Not just the case that Russia intervened, but that the Russian Federation defeated the United States of America in a cyber war in 2016 and got to choose our president. So it goes. Now, how could that happen? There's a logic to this. And the logic isn't just that there are men in Moscow who very carefully exploited modern technology, although that's true, and technically they deserve an enormous amount of respect. What is also true, I said technically, I didn't say ethically, frowns from the Ukrainian contingent. Um, what, 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 but what's more interesting here is to think about this in terms of the shift from the politics of eternity to the politics, sorry, the politics of inevitability to the politics of eternity. What's interesting about Russia is that Russia got to the politics of eternity first. They got there first. The idea that the market would have to bring democracy fails obviously in Russia in the 1990s. Russia instead builds up a kind of regime which depends upon fossil fuels, the extraction of profits from fossil fuels, the centralization of those profits, right? And, and, and becomes a new kind of authoritarianism. In this new kind of authoritarianism, the future is impossible for three reasons. First of all, if you are a natural gas and oil selling regime, you're not gonna be a big friend of talking about climate change. And those of us who do think about the future tend to think about climate change, right? The second reason is that if you are a kleptocracy, there is no social mobility. For the average Russian, social mobility is very difficult. And for that reason as well, there's not a future. The third reason is the problem of succession. No one in Russia knows what's going to happen after Mr. Putin dies. And that sentence is unpronounceable in Russia. Right? It's impossible to think about those things. In that way as well, there's no future. So what do you do? What you do is you turn the politics of eternity not only into domestic policy, you turn it into foreign policy. If your citizens don't trust you to provide law, institutions, and predictability, you don't promise that you're going to do that. What you do is you say, that's the way the world works. Law is a joke. Democracy is a joke. There is no such thing as truth. That's a clever enough strategy domestically. But where it gets truly interesting is when you export that to the United States of America or when you export it to the European Union. What happened to the United States in 2016 is that Russians took our own tendencies, they took the way we were going anyway, our own shift towards the politics of eternity, and they accelerated it. 
They played on our inequalities. They played on our racism. They found ways to teach us that what we really needed was an was eternity politician, which is, of course, is what Mr. Trump is. Make America Great Again is about a cycle. The way that he governs is by instructing us that all we have day to day are threats, physical and sexual, and what we should do is fear. The way that he governs day to day technically is by way of an internet presence, which makes people either elated or outraged, but either way so emotional that it's very hard to carry on normal political conversation. Now, that's the part that you get to enjoy, the part about how America gets things wrong. We're sitting in the middle of the most important zone of contiguous democracies in the world. We are sitting in the middle of the largest economy in the, in the, in the history of the world. These are all very good things, and I congratulate you. However, Europeans also have a politics of inevitability. And just like Americans have trouble seeing their politics of inevitability, even though it's obvious to you, right? Europeans have trouble seeing their politics of inevitability. So I'm going to spell it out very quickly. Here's the European politics of inevitability. Europeans tell themselves the fable of the wise nation. What is the fable of the wise nation? The fable of the wise nation says, European history is long, our nations are old, in the 20th century, our nations learned an important thing, and that is war is bad. And therefore, we decide to cooperate and form a European Union, right? It's a nice story. And like pretty much everything you learn in school, except at my children's school, which I'd like to say is excellent, um, like pretty much everything you learn at school about history, that is entirely false. Every single thing about that is false. European nations are not old. There is pretty much no history of European nation states. The real trajectory of European history is empire to integration. The nation state is an artifact of precisely children's education. It never happened. It's the kind of thing that people put into your heads when you're too young to resist, and then it stays, right? And this has very important implications because this politics of inevitability instructs you that the nation state is there. We can count on it to make good decisions and it will be there for us. Like the American politics of inevitability, which delegates responsibility to the market, this delegates responsibility to the nation, to the nation state, to another abstraction. And in a way, it's a more dangerous abstraction because you have never had it. But because you believe you've had it, your, all of your debates about the European Union are completely warped and nonsensical. Take Brexit, for instance. Both sides of the Brexit debate say, assume that there's such a thing as Great Britain. But when was that exactly? There was a British empire which, like all European empires, began to lose wars and then joined a European integration project. That is your history. That's the history of Germany. Germany lost its great colonial war in Eastern Europe and then began a project of integration. The Netherlands, Belgium, France lost colonial wars and then found their home in Europe. And the history of Europe you tell yourselves about the nation state is a way of not talking about empire. It's a way of not having history. It's a way of telling yourselves that the nation state will always be there for, for you. But why? Why would it? Brexit is not a step back to a comfortable British home. There's no such thing. Brexit is a leap to the unknown. And for this reason, it's not surprising that this very intelligent Russian foreign policy that I spoke of pushed for Brexit very powerfully. And as with the American election, the scholarly consensus is moving more and more towards the view that the tweets and the bots and the RT and the other forms of Russian intervention in Britain might well have actually made the difference. But be that as it may, 
what one sees is a general pattern. What Russia does inside the European Union is the same thing that it does inside the United States. It finds the tendencies that are pushing towards eternity, and it just nudges them a little bit, whether that's by financially supporting the Front National in France, whether it's by supporting AfD in Germany, whether it's by bringing together the extreme right all over Europe. In all of these ways, what Russia does is pushes along this tendency but from, from, etern from inevitability to eternity. And this is why I am so glad that next year is going to be the year of Ukrainian culture in Austria. I'm sure some of you have begun to think, what am I going to do in the year 2019? And this is the answer. It's the year of Ukrainian culture in Austria next year. No one quite knows exactly what the events are going to be, right? But I think there's something in here, all joking aside, which is extremely important. I'm actually, I'm very glad personally that Chancellor Kurz has decided that this is going to be the year of Ukrainian culture because it is in Ukraine, in a, during the war in Ukraine in 2014 and 2015, that all of what I said should have become clear. What happened in Ukraine in 2014 and 2015 was all of us missing the most important things that we might have learned. The true stakes in Ukraine were a movement of people who believed that oligarchy could be defeated, that the rule of law was a good thing, and that the purpose of the European Union is to strengthen the state. Those were the protesters on the Maidan, and they were sensible and in their political conclusions, I think, correct. How much of that were we talking about in 2014 and 2015? Very few of us were talking about those things at all. What we did instead was we allowed ourselves to drift from the politics of inevitability to the politics of eternity. We told ourselves that nothing could really be going wrong. I mean, sure. One European country invaded another European country and the next its territory, the thing which was never supposed to happen. But we told ourselves that nothing was really happened. How do we do that? We accepted eternity. How does that feel? Well, did you find yourself saying it's all about distant cultures, ethnicities? Did you find yourself thinking that's a conflict about a faraway country about which I know little? Did you look at maps in the press which had lines dividing Eastern and Western Ukraine? Did you think for one second that this conflict was about language, right? If this conflict were about language, then America wouldn't exist because I speak English and Austria wouldn't exist because you speak German. The conflict was about Europe and the rule of law and oligarchy and then at the end about truth. And we failed that test. As the West, we failed that test. We failed to see what was in front of us and we invited more of it. Hence, what happened in Ukraine happened then later to us. And I mean that not metaphorically. I mean it very specifically. The things that Russia performed in Ukraine, it then performed on us. The, the, the leader, the head of state, who totally denies factual reality. That seems strange when Mr. Putin did it. We've gotten used to Mr. Trump doing it. The medium-sized lies that take up space in the public sphere. Surrounding every fact with five or ten fictions so it gets bogged down and can't survive. Or maybe the most important thing, the use of the internet to appeal to your own political and indeed psychological predispositions so that you can't think sensibly about politics. In Ukraine, it worked like this. If you were on the left, you were told that the government of Ukraine were Nazis. If you were on the right, and I'm, this is just by chance, it's my right hand, I don't mean anything about you at all, sir, personally. If you were on the right, the far right, you were told that the government of Ukraine were Jews. It does not matter that those two things contradict because the people who use the internet over here have no contact with the people who use the internet over here. That is what Europeans were told, and many educated, prominent, influential Europeans and Americans repeated that. That is exactly what happened in the American presidential elections. African Americans were instructed 
by Russian web pages, very intelligently designed, not to vote on the logic that Hillary Clinton was a racist. Meanwhile, American racists were instructed to vote on the logic that Hillary Clinton loved blacks. Muslims were instructed not to vote on the logic that Hillary Clinton didn't like Muslims. Meanwhile, conservatives were energized to vote on the logic that she loved Muslims. How could that happen? These things contradict. Because the way the internet works, these people and these people had no contact whatsoever with one another. So, what can we do about all of this? If I'm right, and we're standing, or rather sitting, in a kind of transition, the sitting is important, right? This is more couch fascism than it is fascism. Um, if I'm right that we are standing or sitting, passing through a transition from e inevitability to eternity, what can we possibly do? The first thing that I think we can do is to recognize what in inevitability and eternity have in common. People we know have seen this, have experienced it. People you know have done this. Certainly people I know have done this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, the UNESCO play Rhinoceros, but the, the, the feeling of the friends you have who you think could never take such a position and then they do and then they stick with that position until they're unrecognizable. Other people shift from inevitability to eternity and then finally you do as well. It's all around us. How is it possible that you can shift from one to the other? Well, because deep down, they have things in common. One of the things they have in common is that both of them do away with history. If you believe that progress is inevitable, you don't actually need the facts. If you believe that doom is inevitable, you don't need the facts either. And the other thing which they have in common is that they both do away with moral responsibility. If the future is going to be better no matter what we do, then none of us has to be, has to be concerned. If the enemy is coming no matter what we do, none of us has to be concerned. And we don't have to ask what good and evil are in politics, because of course, we're innocent and therefore good. And they're coming for us and therefore evil. So what can we do? How can this be stopped? How can we exit this? I have three very quick ideas. The first is, history itself. The idea that time goes forward, it seems like a very modest proposal, but I would like to ask that we agree that time moves forward. I would like for us to ask, to ask us to agree that unpredictable things happen. I would like to ask for us to agree that if we understand the structures around us, that puts us in a position to take decisions that might then make a difference. That's what history is all about. And in that sense, I'm afraid, history has to be political thought. Because inevitability and eternity are both crowding out history. Inevitability crowds out history in the name of statistics and certainty about the future. Eternity crowds out history in the name of memory, in the name of the thing that makes us and them, the name of the thing which gives us victimhood and certainty. Memory crowds out history. The second thing I would press for here in Europe is, and this has to do with history, integration. I'm not going to tell you what kind of European Union you have to have. I am simply going to point out that if you like Austria or if you like Britain or if you like France, it makes sense also to like Europe because those things have never really existed without Europe. Allowing Europe to fade away is allowing the state to fade away. The whole debate in Europe, as I see it, is historically backwards. Europe and the state support one another. That's the lesson of history. If you get rid of Europe, what you need to be ready for is to go back to empire. Good luck. The third thing which I think is very important is factuality. Factuality. Um, factuality in the sense of local news. It is very easy to fill up this entire space with fiction and nonsense and internet memes. I'm not doing it by waving my hands. You don't have to look at the ceiling. But it, it trusts me, it's extremely easy to do. What we have to be able to do is to conquer 1% of the public space with locally reported investigative journalism. Just 1%. And I think that would be enough. The reason for this is that there are two reasons. The first is that the Factuality is the thing that allows us to defend ourselves 
from spectacle. Factuality is the thing that Russia, the US, and the UK are losing, right? Factuality is the thing which allows countries to defend themselves. There's a reason why ERF 1 exists. And that reason is that at a time, at one time, countries understood that sovereignty depended upon having some kind of public medium. I'm afraid that informational sovereignty, I will now sound very conservative for a moment, informational sovereignty is extremely important for national existence now. If you don't have any idea and can't keep track of what your children are doing on those screens, there may not be a nation and there may not be people who are capable of following truthful arguments. And by the way, those of you who are looking at screens now, I can see the reflection on your glasses and it's super eerie. Okay. Um, the, 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 the final thing, oh, and so I'm now say something which sounds very naive. We have to believe in truth. That's not the same thing as being certain about it all the time, but the pursuit of truth is a very different ethical and political stance than the stance which says, I don't know, it's all an opinion. As soon as you say, I don't know, it's all an opinion, what you're really saying is hooray for authoritarianism. I wish it were otherwise, young people, but that's the way it is. If you say it's all an opinion, I don't know, that means you are going to get rolled over and destroyed by the people who best know how to appeal to your emotional proclivities and your psychological weaknesses. You're, if you don't believe in truth, you will lose out and your country will lose out and your friends will lose out to spectacle. That's what's happening all around us. And then the final thing, and, and I will close here, is equality. Equality another old-fashioned idea. It's not a coincidence that Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States are the places where the political surprises have come first. It's not a coincidence because inequality isn't just unpleasant. Inequality makes it hard for people to be together in a democracy or otherwise. If you have a billion dollars and I have one dollar, the truth is not enough for you and it's too much for me. If you have a billion dollars and I have, a, and I have one dollar, we have absolutely nothing to talk about. And if you have a billion dollars and I have one dollar, you can shape the internet around me, and it's very possible that you do. Inequality is not primarily about money. Inequality is about people believing they belong to the same society, with facts, but also with futures. Because you see, with inequality comes eternity in a very direct way. When people don't believe that they have a future as individual or as families, they're much more vulnerable to political ideas which say the same thing happens over and over and over again. So these traditional ideas, if we can take them seriously and earnestly, may help us to face the postmodern problems that we have around us. And I insist that there are things that we can do. And I insist that it matters that we try to understand where we are. If we see where we are, then we can begin to make the first steps. And it's not all about defense. It's not enough to hold this back. It has to be about creation, right? I will say about democracy what Gandhi said about Western civilization. It would be a wonderful thing and we are only just at the start. And that is the optimistic note. The 21st century might be the century of democracy because we haven't had one yet, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, please take a seat. Okay. <laughs> Herzlichen Dank, Professor Snyder, für diesen tollen, inspirierenden Vortrag. Da wurden jetzt ein paar ganz wichtige Dinge 
angesprochen, Türen in Räume aufgemacht, durch die er jetzt gemeinsam mit äh, der Rektorin des Instituts für die Wissenschaften von Menschen, Charlene Randeria, wandern wird. Äh, bevor ich Sie zu uns auf die Bühne bitte, möchte ich auch noch ein paar Worte zu ihr, ihrer Biografie sagen. Sie wurde in Washington D.C. geboren. Sie hat Soziologie und Sozialanthropologie studiert und zwar an der Daly University, der Oxford University und in Berlin an der Freien Universität. Nach Stationen in Budapest und Zürich ist sie seit 2012 Professorin für Soziologie und Sozialanthropologie am Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Genf. Seit dem Jahr 2015 ist sie quasi Pendlerin zwischen der Schweiz und Österreich, zwischen Genf und Wien, denn damals wurde sie zur Rektorin des IWM in Wien ernannt. In ihrer Forschungsarbeit beschäftigt sich äh, Charlene Randeria mit den Themen Globalisierung und Entwicklung, Recht und Politik, Zivilgesellschaft, soziale Bewegungen und NGOs. Und falls Sie sich jetzt wundern sollten, wenn im Gespräch ein paar Thesen oder zentrale Aussagen des Vortrags noch einmal wiederholt werden, dann liegt das daran, dass die Vorlesung vom ORF aufgezeichnet wird, aber in der Sendung auf ORF 3 nicht alles Platz haben wird und mit Blick auf dieses Fernsehpublikum wird Rektorin Randeria ein paar Dinge vielleicht auch wiederholen. Ich bitte Sie auf die Bühne, Professor Schneider und Sie auch. Um, so let me begin uh, by trying to understand your own journey uh, with the book The Road to Unfreedom. Um, I think uh, you uh, mark a trajectory of your own from a really well-known historian of totalitarianism, um, the author of Bloodlands and Black Earth, to a political activist and a political commentator uh, whose book on tyranny was a world bestseller. Bloodlands, of course, I'm very happy to say, was written in Vienna at the IWM, so we can claim some ownership of the book. Um, and in Bloodlands, you highlighted the importance of Eastern and Central Europe Uh, for the history of 20th century Europe, something which you have underlined again very strongly today. On tyranny was your response to Trump's election, rather unexpected um, uh, electoral success, and you argued that Americans should get rid of a mindset of exceptionalism, that it, the mindset which said it cannot happen to us, It um, has never happened here. And instead, you argued that they should, contemporary America, should look through the lens of Europe's 20th century history at itself, using as a lens both the experience of National Socialism and of Stalinism, and of also, of course, resistance to these. Your new book offers a site diagnosis. You are, it's a history of the present. It's an attempt to define the nature of where we find ourselves today and how on earth did we get here and why. If I were to sum up the central argument in a sentence and I quote you, you say, the road to unfreedom is the passage from the politics of inevitability to the politics of eternity, end of quote. And the argument is that in the post-1989 liberal euphoria that announced the end of history on the one hand and the triumph of the market on the other hand, also in a sense rendered politics as we knew it superfluous by proclaiming in the words of Reagan and Thatcher that there is no alternative. This insistence on the absence of political choices in the face of market fundamentalism and the inevitable rise of democracy is something which you call the politics of inevitability and you've juxtaposed it in the book to what you call the politics of eternity which you see as 
not only following, but also caused by the politics mm -hmm. of inevitability. And the politics of eternity, if I understand you rightly, is the return of an authoritarian, nation-centered politics of identity represented by Putin's Russia, but not only there, and that's something I'll come to in a moment, which is marked both by a politics of resentment and a politics of victimhood. That said, well, the first thing I would like to discuss with you is, you called them two kinds of politics of time, and I had the feeling these are two politics or two temptations of timelessness, mm -hmm. uh, rather. Um, and the question for me is, why do you choose to frame your argument on neoliberal capitalism and on populist identity politics in terms of eternity and inevitability? I, I, well, so first of all, it, it has to do with where I found myself in a particular place in time. I, I was reading Hamlet in the fall of 2016, and I, I, I had this very interesting moment with my own students at Yale where they asked me after the election of Trump, will you please, Professor Snyder, tell us what you really think? Um, which, of course, was not appropriate in the setting of a, a class on Eastern Europe. Although it should be said that in the, in the spring of 2016, when I ended my, my, my lecture class on Eastern Europe, I said, you're going to hear a lot more about this man, Paul Manafort, um, which has turned out to be true. It is very much the case that things which were very familiar to Russians and Ukrainians have slowly become familiar to us. But I was, I was in this position of wanting to be able to explain what I thought, but I wanted to give the students a way of thinking about it, which would allow them simultaneously to engage and take a distance, right? To believe that they could do something without feeling overwhelmed. And what, when I looked at them, when I looked at these kids who had literally known nothing but Obama, right? Which is, I mean, there's a problem with knowing nothing but Obama. He's so nice. And it seemed like he was just going to take care of everything and that we didn't really have any more problems anymore. And look how wonderful we were because we'd reached the end of a trajectory and we'd elected a black president. Imagine kids who had grown up with eight years of Obama and couldn't remember anything else. This was, this was them. And so I was trying to shake them in to history. And the, the idea of inevitability began as my mild critique of Obama, right? My mild critique of the Clintons, my mild critique of the, 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 the slightly complacent American idea that everything was going in the right way. We just needed to tweak things a bit. Right, my mild critique of the fact that we didn't react to 2008 to, to, to the financial crisis of 2008 in a more dramatic way. In 2008, we should have bailed out the newspapers. We should have bailed out the newspapers in 2008. We bailed out the banks, and we're still bailing them out. We should have bailed out the newspapers in 2008. It would have cost nothing, and we didn't do it, and we'd be in a better world. But no one was creative in 2008. Interestingly, it wasn't like the 30s, right? The 30s were full of ideas, good and bad, about what to do about the Great Depression. After 2008, we didn't have any ideas except give a lot of money to Wall Street, which I admit, is an, it's an idea. It's just not the only possible idea that one could have. It's a beautiful example itself of the politics of inevitability, right? Um, and when I tried to explain, not at my home university, but at, at, at a university um, up north, and this rivalry will be meaningless to you, but it's called Harvard. Um, I was giving a lecture about these ideas to the kids at Harvard, and one of them in the back looked at his watch, and I said, okay, why are you looking at your watch? And he said, well, because a famous Wall Street investment bank is about to start its recruiting party. And I said, okay, that helps me explain the politics of inevitability and the politics of eternity. Before Trump was elected, you thought, I'm going to go work on Wall Street because everything's going to be great. Now you think you're going to go work on Wall Street because everything's going to be terrible anyway. And they were like, yeah. That's where it started, right? Trying to explain to a young generation which we have raised without history. 
right? I, I see this as a tremendous, one of the many, many failings of my generation. Um, we raised them without history. Now we have to say to them, oh, and by the way, <laughs> 27, 34, 38, right? By the way, oh, by the way, right? So that's where it started as a way of trying to get them to think about history by getting them to see that, as you say, the ways that we escape history are by forming these bubbles of timelessness around ourselves. So that, that's how it started. So if I take up the point on history, uh, the thing is, populism is not new. We've had populism before. We've known many waves of uh, populism. And you coin a very interesting term to distinguish Trump's populism from others, and you call it sadopopulism. Uh, and your argument here uh, is that whereas populism normally is about maximum gain uh, for the masses, Trump's version of populism is about causing maximum pain to the masses. And the puzzle here is as to why and how does sadopopulism work and what makes it so successful, particularly in the U.S.? Okay, so it's, it's a, that's a wonderful question because I think one of the things we have to do when we think about 21st century authoritarianism is ask ourselves what is old and what is new? And there's not a clear answer to that. It's not the 1930s, but it's also not totally unlike the 1930s. There are some, sim there are some obvious similarities, like thinkers from the 1930s are being brought back from Russia to America and in every country in between. There are some obvious similarities to the 1930s in the sense of return to a politics of us and them. But there are also some obvious differences. Um, fascists wanted us to get out on the street. Mr. Putin really doesn't like it when people get out on the street. Mr. Trump really doesn't like it when people get out on the street either. What he likes to do is pretend that lots of people were out on the street, but that's not at all the same thing, right? The fascists wanted real people out on the street. Mr. Trump wants fake people out on the street, and there's an important difference there, right? Fascism was about the big lie. Fascism was about the overwhelming lie which reshaped all of reality around you. What we have now is about the medium-sized lie. It's about throwing fictions at you that are big enough to confuse and deflect political discussion. They don't give you a worldview, but they might confirm the things you already think and fear. And now I'm going to try to approach the question. One other thing which fascism, which fascism did, um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to connect this to populism in a second. One other thing that fascism did, we should remember, is that it promised transfers of wealth. Right? National socialism, it promised transfers of wealth. It promised transfers of wealth from Jews to non-Jews, but it promised transfers of wealth. It promised redistribution and it delivered on that promise before and during um, a horrifying world war. That's something which is different, right? Populists also promised transfers of wealth. I mean, characteristic of populism is the idea that there is some kind of an elite that has too much, and then there's some kind of a people that has too little, and the idea of policy is going to be to make a transfer. Notice that the leading characters in this story do not do that. They do the opposite. Right? I mean, Russia is the most unequal country in the world at, at, at the moment, right? The United States is one of the few countries which can possibly compete and we're moving, we're moving in that direction. Mr. Trump talked about building a wall, right? But he doesn't actually build an actual wall. He talked about building highways, but he's not building actual highways. There isn't actually a new welfare state being created before our eyes. And this way, it's not like fascism. The opposite is happening. What Mr. Trump does, and this is what I mean by sadopopulism, he's trying to keep the pain going, sadly, and he's succeeding. He's not doing anything to reduce inequalities of wealth, obviously. They're getting worse. The opioid crisis is not coming to an end in the United States. It's getting worse. 
20 veterans of the United States Armed Services still commit suicide statistically every day. Um, and the rate of suicide is even higher among other constituencies that voted for Mr. Trump, like farmers. The rate of suicide among American farmers is absolutely catastrophic, right? The way the, way the logic works is that if you're Mr. Trump, you came to power and you stay in power by providing bogus explanations of people's pain. For that kind of politics to work, you need two things. You need bogus explanations and you need pain. Okay, I'm going to come back to the question of uh, if you think the American soil is a particularly fertile one for such a politics, and if so, at the moment. But you may want to uh, deal with it now, because the question is, this kind of state of populism doesn't work everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in India, the populism looks very different. So that I think there may be something specific about the United States of America that we need to explain here. I think you're right. And I th so this overall scheme, of eternity to inevitability. Are you, are you fact-checking my suicide claims? Okay. <laughs> um, um, it, it's a, well, they're, they're right. Um, the, the, I think the, the overall eternity to inevitability scheme, it's meant to embrace a lot of countries at the same time. One of the things that's very important for me is that we see ourselves as going through things together. So I, tr I try very hard to learn from Russians. I've probably learned more from Russians in the last five years than I've learned from anyone else except Ukrainians in anticipation of what was going to happen in my own country. I think it's very important for Europeans not to look at the British or the Americans and say, oh, well, that can only happen to English speaking peoples. <laughs> right? <laughs> So it's important to me for us to see all this as variations on a theme, which is what I think it is, but the variations are significant. The way that you go from eternity, from inevitability to eternity is different. In the US, um, it's the very people who are most convinced that they don't need government help who are most vulnerable. And that has to do with our own version of nationalism. It, the, precisely those veterans and those farmers are the people who think the government can't do anything for me and that makes them, that makes them vulnerable. So I agree, to you, that, I agree with you, there's a specific way in which our inevitability switches into our eternity. Uh, there's another historical point which I want to uh, pursue uh, with you, and that is your book tells the story of a reversal. The story that you tell is the decades of the 1990s and 2000s is a decade in which uh, we sought to export Western European models and ideas and practices, institutions to Eastern and Central Europe, liberal democracy, capitalism, rule of law, civil society, everything which we thought was important uh, was transplanted successfully or less successfully to um, Eastern Europe. 2010, the tide seems to turn in that what you show in your book is that ideas, practices, and the influence flows the other way around, from the East to the West, as Putin successfully manipulates electoral politics and the outcomes of uh, elections in the US as Russian interventions aim to split the EU with its support for right-wing uh, populist anti-EU parties. The question for me is, what are the structural factors which underlie this kind of a reversal? Because the puzzle for me is, why should the Russian model of either economy or society be attractive to anybody outside mm -hmm. of Russia? I think it probably is not even attractive for everyone in Russia, but the big puzzle for me is, what constitutes its attraction for anybody in a Western democracy? What makes it so easy to import these right. ideas? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. I think there are some sources of direct attraction, but I agree with the premise of the question. That's not the real explanation, but I'm, I'm going to mention some of the things that people do find sympathetic in Russia. Russia is authentically popular among some Europeans and some Americans uh, who believe in ideas like white supremacy. 
American white supremacists genuinely see Mr. Putin as the leader of a white supremacist movement. If you know anything about the demographic structure of Russia or indeed about the ethnic composition of the Russian leadership, that's a strange view to hold. But from a distance, people genuinely like it. Certainly many Americans, and I think a certain number of Europeans as well, are attracted to the Russian politics of sexual anxiety, um, in particular the Russian argument that, that homosexuality is um, a, a plague, a form of corruption, the thing which is destroying the West, and so on and so forth. That idea was actually formed with the help of some American evangelicals, and it's an idea which Amer some Americans and some Europeans find attractive. But I think there are, more, there are deeper things going on. The first is the technique, and the, the, the second is the adaptation of an old Soviet, let's say, weapon to a new postmodern world. So the technique is distrust. Taking distrust and using it as a weapon in the world. How, do, how does that work? How do you govern from distrust? And this is one of the things that I think is authentically new and important about the 21st century. We haven't really had governments before which said, as the American government now does, or parts of it, and the Russian government now does, we've never had governments before which said, yeah, sure, we lie to you all the time. That's new in the history of governance to my knowledge, right? I mean, up until now, we've had two possibilities, governments that say we tell the truth or governments that say we tell the truth some of the time. But the exuberant embrace of this kind of, 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 of extreme relativism, which says not only am I not telling the truth right now, but nobody has ever told the truth ever, right? Which then comes with a knowing wink, which says, but of course, you know that. We all know that. We're all smart people here. We know that nothing's really true, right? So what I see is a historical development in Russia, which simply proceeds faster than it proceeds elsewhere. That's a historical development in which local news goes away. Hugely, hugely important. Local news goes away. People began to speak not of news and journalists, but of the media. People have harder, a harder time distinguishing distant media from conspiracy theories and things they would like to believe anyway, right? And then with the turn that the Russian government makes, um, led by a man called Vladislav Surikov, is they say, well, yes, you distrust us, that's right. And you should also distrust the British and the Americans and the European Union, and you should distrust law and democracy and institutions, and you should just distrust everything. That turns out to be a way to govern because you can say, well, in Russia, things are like this, but they're like this in America and Britain and in Europe as well. And that explains a lot of the success of Russian foreign policy because a lot of what the Russians, have, the Russian doesn't do what the Soviet Union does. It doesn't say we have a model for the future. It completely wipes out discussion of the future by encouraging people to be angry at one another in the present, largely on the basis of claims that are not true. So I mentioned the idea um, in 2016 that uh, uh, Hillary Clinton is a, a pedophile pimp who sells sex with children out of the basement of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. Okay. I'm not going to ask how many of you believe that, right? I mean, you know, I assume that it's about half and half in this room. Um, but I will repeat that about a third of the American population believe that at a certain time. Why did they believe that? They believe that because at the moment when it was revealed that Mr. Trump had been taped saying that it was legitimate to sexually assault women, at that particular moment, the Russian Federation then dumped a series of emails which, with the help of American conspiracy theorists, were worked up into a story about how Hillary Clinton sold sex with children. Right? These are things which would not work in the world that we're familiar with, but they work now. They work in a world where many Americans don't believe authorities, where they believe the things which confirm their prior political or emotional or psychological disposition. So it's in order for this to work, 
you don't have to look at Russia and say that's a wonderful country. In fact, you don't have to know that it was Russia at all. At all. You don't have any experience with Russia. And then there's one more technical point that I'm going to make for you aficionados of, of, of secret war out there. So there's a long tradition in the Russian Federation, the thing in Russia, the thing which the Russians were always better than the West at. Actually, there are many things, and, they, and many of the words are Russian, like disinformation and provocation and active measures. Those are all originally Russian terms, and there's a reason for that. These go back to the Imperial Russian Secret Services. They go through the whole history of the Soviet Union, and they come to us. The one that I'm going to focus on is active measures. Active measures mean I find some vulnerability in you and I use it to get you to do something that is not in your interest. Like electing Donald Trump, for example, right? I find the dispositions and the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities in you that are going to get you to do something that is against your own interests. You don't know it's me, right? Now, before the internet, that was really hard. Active measures were hard. You had to have personal contact. Maybe you wrote a letter, right? It was hard to do active measures. Thanks to the internet, active measures are extremely easy. The Russian secret services are doing the same thing that they were very good at doing in the Soviet Union, but we have opened a channel in the West, and especially in America, to our own hearts and minds. The way the internet works now is basically a giant invitation to say, oh, you're an intelligent foreign power with a history of using active measures. Why not get right into the back of my brain now? That's the way the internet works, alas. Okay. Uh, Tim, I'd like to pick up two points uh, mm -hmm. from what you just said. And actually, I'd like to pick up on two concepts which you've used. Uh, your book comes up with, uh, it crafts a whole new political vocabulary to describe our times. Schizofascism, implausible deniability, etc. I want to pick up on two points which you just made. One is a term which you use in the book, and I think it's a very apt term to describe a very particular dimension of the sexualization of politics, which you just referred to. Uh, and that is, you use the term sexual geopolitics. And it's an intriguing term because I think it's able to describe very many different kinds of sexualized discourses in politics uh, today. And I think it would be interesting to just hear you on that. Mm -hmm. So when when I was when uh, um, when I was in Ohio, um, the the provincial American state where I'm from, in the fall of 2016, I was uh, for a, a, a few days I was driving a car across a couple of counties in Ohio, and I passed I counted them every day I passed 92 signs posters. This was the time of the presidential election. And 90 of them were Trump for president. And there were two of them that were about Hillary Clinton. And they both said Clinton for prison. Now, there's something deep going on there. What is it about us or some of us that finds it attractive to think not just that she should lose, but that she should be in prison. One of the things that Russia did in our, the 2016 elections was they hired a man in Florida to drive a pickup truck with a cage in the back with someone dressed up as Hillary Clinton in the cage with her hands on the bars rattling the cage. Why was that attractive? Why did people like that. Why were there bumper stickers in Ohio and around the country where, which said, Trump that bitch? Why? Why is, it, why is it not enough to be against a political opponent? Why must she be treated as a sexual object to be denigrated at the same time? What is going on with masculinity that someone like Mr. Trump can stand in as the example of a successful man. Because here's the thing about Mr. Trump, 
which is actually very comparable to fascists of the 1930s. He's a kind of winner-loser. He's never wanted anything except he gets to run the country, right? Think of Himmler. Think of Hitler, for that matter. These are not people who ever succeeded at anything except they get to run the country. Mr. Trump is not a successful businessman. I hope no one here in Austria is under the illusion that he has any money because he doesn't. He's currently scouring the world for dictators who will give him some, but he does not actually have any. He has hundreds of millions of dollars of documented debts. He has no documented wealth, at least that he has shown us about, right? Um, he is a winner-loser. He is a winner-loser. He is someone who can say to people, Maybe things haven't worked out for you, but I've got a magic formula. I've got the blonde hair. I've got the gold name on the building, right? I've got just the thing which is going to turn you from a loser into a winner. Of course, he, he wouldn't use those words. Something is wrong with masculinity there, right? Something is going on deep in the shift from inevitability to eternity, which has to do with masculinity. Something is going on when men can be so threatened by the idea of the Mexican rapists, which Mr. Trump, um, it, you know, talked about, or when men can be so threatened by the idea of a gay international. So I'm, not everybody I know was watching Russian television as obsessively as I was in the fall of 2013. But so I'll just tell you, I'll spare you the trouble of finding all the reruns on Pervi Canal. Um, in the fall of 2013, when Ukrainian students began to demonstrate on behalf of a closer relationship to the European Union, the very first trope that Russian television chose for them was that they were all gay and their leaders were gay and the European Union was gay and if Ukraine ever joined the European Union, it would make everybody gay and I'm not exaggerating, I'm actually understating because a lot of it was much more colorful than that and I would be giving RF serious problems if I described it in detail. So something is going on here, right? And it, the, the, an interesting effect, I mean, if you look at Mr. Putin and Mr. Trump together, these are both people who have a kind of overstated and understated masculinity at the same time. There's something over the top about, uh, well, I, Mr. Trump never takes his shirt off, you know, for good reason, but there's something over the top about masculinity. At the same time, there's something fearful and frightened and threatened about the masculinity at, at the same time. I haven't answered your question. I'm trying to put my finger on something, though. Yes. Let me move to the second concept, which has something to do uh, with the way you've been uh, describing uh, Russian foreign policy. And I think this is a very, very interesting concept which you come up with and you call it strategic relativism. And you used it briefly uh, earlier and I think it might be uh, uh, important to understand what kind of strategy are you describing in Russian policy when you are talking about Russian interventions as part of something what you call strategic relativism. Okay. You know, I, I'm going to do that, but let me first take another crack at the masculinity because there's something, there's something interesting about globalization, which is that it turns out that it's our fears and our anxieties that are generic. The idea, of, the idea was that progress was supposed to be generic enlightenment was supposed to be generic. We were all supposed to enlighten ourselves in the same direction. But what we find out instead, at least sometimes, like now, is that it's our anxieties that are generic. So the fear, the fear, of, the fear of gay marriage turns out to have a lot of resonance around a lot of the world, the Muslim world, to the American Christian world, to the Russian Orthodox world, to parts of the European Union. That's a very generic fear. The fear of migration turns out to have a lot of play, regardless of whether there are migrants or not, over a lot of... And these are generic. This is the thing. This is the irony. Because we, they make us feel like we're part of a community, but they're actually the least specific kinds of fears. Fears of physical and sexual violation are the least specific things about us. They're the most basic thing about us. They don't define us as nations or societies at all right? They're totally generic. 
And I, I say this in the context of the geopolitics because these are things you can try out. If you're, if you're a Russian programmer in St. Petersburg working for the Internet Research Agency, you don't have to know anything about actual American racial politics to get a lot of American white people excited about black people. You don't because a lot of it is simply generic, right? So that's, that's the thing I wanted to add about, about, the, about the geopolitics. Um, sorry, Shalini, that was, what was the next thing? I got carried away. So, no, no, no. Just tell me that there was a question again. The, on strategic relativism. Oh, yeah. We can skip so, it. I can go to migration, which was yeah, a very... Sure. Uh, yeah, So I think the... the, the because on, on migration, you know, while reading the book, I had um, uh, a question which I wanted to ask you, and that was the following. The argument you make is that eternity politics functions by manufacturing a crisis or multiple crises, mm -hmm. which are then instrumentalized to mobilize emotions around these panics. And the question I had was, is migration a manufactured crisis? And if so, is it manufactured by the Russians? Yeah. So I'm going to try to unite the question I forgot with the question that you just asked. Um, one of, so let's think back to how the Obama administration characterized Russia, which I think was both analytically and diplomatically quite wrongheaded. What, what, what the Obama administration said about Russia was that it was a regional power which is, I think, not both not true and in, it's both insulting and not true. And, and it's kind of self-deluding if you're an American, because if they're a regional power, why do they get to choose who's the next president after o o Obama? But what Obama had in mind is what I'm calling the politics of inevitability. You know, the, people look at Russia and they say, aha, um, that's just a country that doesn't export anything except raw materials. They don't invent anything. They, they, they have low rates of economic growth. Therefore, they don't matter because we all know that politics is determined by economics. We're all Wall Street Marxists. But in fact, the way the world works, you can have political reach without economics because you can use the techniques that are now available in the dark globalized world that we now live in, namely the internet, and also to some extent television, to spread generic fears, and you can do it tactically. So is migration a real or is it a provoked crisis? It's obviously both, and it's a very good example of how the politics of eternity works. Um, of course, there are Mexicans in the United States. Of course, it's true that rates of migration of Mexicans were higher than people expected over the last three decades. Of course, it's also true that there's a war in Syria and that that war in Syria, as well as instability in North Africa, as well as general poverty and fundamentally underlying all of it, climate change. Of course, it's true that those things lead to migration of real people in substantial numbers to the European Union. However, there's then a question of what you do about it and, and how you treat it. And all Russia does is that it takes people and tries to spin them towards the reaction of those people are outsiders and their sexual threats. So um, the, 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 the most direct intervention in, in, in European migration politics by Russia is the choice to bomb lots of civilians in Syria. That causes more migration to Europe. Um, two weeks after Angela Merkel says we will take half a million refugees, the Russian Federation begins to bomb Syrian civilians, thereby creating more refugees. You may judge that a coincidence. I think it's unlikely. The second direct way that Russia intervenes in the migration discussion in Europe is to invent or sharpen situations where people are afraid sexually of migrants. The example of this is January 2016 in Germany, where a non-existent case, a non-existent case of Muslim gang rape was used to mobilize um, Soviet Germans, post-Soviet Germans, Russian Germans, as well as a good deal of German public opinion as a whole against migrants and against, above all, Chancellor Angela Merkel. Something which didn't happen was spread over the media and mobilized real people, 
on a fairly massive scale. This was, this was the Lisa F. affair. So, of course, there were actually migrants in Berlin at the time, but the particular event did not take place. This was one of these medium-sized lies. So I think migration is in between, right? I think it's, it's, not, it's not surprising that... It's not surprising, and one has to be realistic, and one can't expect that every society can take an unlimited amount of novelty, right? At the same time, one has to be aware that how we think about migrants can be very easily manipulated. If a presidential candidate refers to Mexican rapists, as Mr. Trump did, that very quickly affects the way people think about Mexicans. If the, if the president of the United States um, decides that he's going to have a special office in which you denounce your Mexican neighbors, which we, we have, it's charming, um, it makes it much more likely for Americans to think that Mexicans commit crimes. Although in fact, they are, they are only half as likely to commit crimes as people who were born in the United States, a statistic which nobody ever believes, right? It's a little bit like the statistic that the, great, the, the, the most important foreign criminals in Austria are, you all know this, right? The Germans, of course, right? The Germans. Sorry, are there German diplomats in the room? So it's like the, 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 actual, like the actual statistics don't have to line up. Is it, a, is it a real problem? Yes. Does it matter hugely how it's spun in our minds, and particularly whether it's spun towards physical and sexual threat? Also, yes. Uh, Tim, I'm going to move you away from Russia for a moment, if you will permit me. Oh, yeah. And that is to say, what about the rest of the world? Now, where I look at the world from, or one of the places from where I look at the world from is India. And um, uh, for, from, for many people in South Asia, Southeast Asia, China would be uh, the focus of attention if they're thinking of uh, geopolitical ambitions, if they're thinking of a power which is intervening in very many ways, uh, overt, covert, um, has both um, uh, very, very strong economic power, but also uh, authoritarian um, uh, uh, regimes, uh, a regime which would probably be a much greater challenge to democracy in the region than Russia's meddling games. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why is China so absent in your book? China is absent because it's because it's everywhere. China's China's everywhere in this argument. If we if 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 we look at if we look at geopolitics from a sober Russian point of view, and I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about Russia, Russia in, or, in, order, in order to talk about China. <laughs> but if we look if we look at geopolitics from a sober Russian point of view, or from a traditional geopolitical point of view. There's no threat from Europe. Europe's not going to invade Russia and take its precious raw materials. There's no threat from America. America's not going to invade and take Russia's precious raw materials. We have plenty of precious raw materials. Um, there's no threat in a traditional sense from Europe and the United States. In a traditional sense, there is, of course, a massive threat from China. China has a very long border with the Russian Federation. China is not self-sufficient in food. Russia is going to become an ever more important producer of food as global warming continues. China is not self-sufficient in water. Water is something of which there is a fair amount in Siberia. China is not self-sufficient in energy. There's a great deal of natural gas just north of China in the Russian Federation. If you look at this from a very traditional geopolitical point of view, there is no reason why Russia should be concerned about Europe and America, but there is every reason to be concerned about China. And so in the book, China's in the background um, because China's in a way more important than everything else. What all of these things that we're describing are in a way, they're just like the warm up act for Chinese power, because if you are Russia and you're sober, the last thing you want to do is alienate and weaken the West, because your own power position depends upon being able to tilt between the West and China. Making the West weaker is actually the last thing you should do. Alienating the entire left wing of American politics for the next 50 years is not the thing you should be doing if you're thinking about the long term and having to deal with with China. So what's happening in a way 
this thing that exercises Americans and Russians and Europeans so much is a kind of sideshow. Um, it's, it's Russia turning away from its own strategic problem, which is China, um, and getting involved in a war that it can win. This is the thing. Like, it's possible to mess around with America on the internet. We don't have any controls, and we don't care whether your English is any good. Try messing around with China on the internet. Right? You, need a, you would need a bunch of Chinese speakers, which you don't have. You would need to be able to get through Chinese barriers, which you can't do. You'd have to exploit their social media, which work in a completely different way. It can't be done. It's much more fun, and I use the word carefully, it's much more fun to mess with Europe and the United States. It's much more fun to mess with open societies where you can get a quick result and feel like you've done something. But I agree with you, China's in the background. The, so the way I would characterize it, if you look at the whole Northern Hemisphere, it would be something like this. The Americans and the Europeans thought they had a model, but this model is collapsing around them. The Russians know they don't have a model, but they also know how to make the American and the European model collapse more quickly. The Chinese have a system but they don't regard it as a model for other people. That's, that's, how I, that's how I see it. So, I mean, if you're asking who's winning from all of this, China is definitely winning from all of this. And, you know, and, and so, and I, I, can, I completely agree with you, China is perfecting, as it were, off stage, or, or to the side of all of this drama, it's perfecting another kind of authoritarian system, yeah. So uh, I want to push you on another aspect of your argument on the uh, politics of uh, eternity um, and the politics of inevitability. You see both a chronological and a causal relationship between the two, and that's also the title of your book. It's The Road to Unfreedom. It leads from the one to the other. What if I were to say to you, look at India, look at Turkey, look at many countries which exhibit at the moment a hybrid mixture of both. We didn't move from the one to the other. We have both of them simultaneously, but in different kinds of combinations. And that probably needs a different kind of explanation from mm -hmm. the one that you have provided partly in the book. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. What I'm, what I'm trying to do in the book is explain a very specific problem, which is why is it that all of our self-assured democracies, our in the sense of Northern Hemisphere, right, American, European, why, did, why are those democracies under threat when we didn't expect them to be under threat? Why is that happening? And why is it, again, in the Northern Hemisphere, in this kind of transatlantic space, why is it that Russia has so much more influence than we think? Why is it that events in Russia and Ukraine are so uncannily predictive of events in the United States and the European Union? I'm trying to explain how influence, as you said before, t the, the tilt was from west to east, now the tilt is from east to west, and why? And the, the inevitability and eternity ideas help me with that because you can, if you look at the US, you can get a pretty clear idea of an of inevitability. If you look at the EU, you get another idea of inevitability, both of which open themselves up to, you know, if you'll pardon the term, both of which create their own contradictions and open themselves up to financial crashes and external interventions. Um, in the US case, it creates inequality, which invites eternity as a form of politics. So I'm trying to explain that specific thing, but I agree with you that it doesn't have to be that neat. Um, you can have eternity and inevitability at the same time. You can have a leader, um, you can have a leader as in India who simultaneously uses both, right? They, they're, not, they're, not mutually, they're not mutually exclusive. And indeed, in the cases that I'm talking about, what you'll find is there's like there's a there's a kernel of inevitability in there somewhere and that's what makes the eternity possible so russia and trump are possible because of totally unregulated capitalism right there's a there's a it's i agree with you it's a it's a mishmash and in 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 the non-european cases i think you see that very clearly let me turn in my final two questions to um something maybe slightly more hopeful um, and that is uh, what uh, you call the politics of the possible um, 
in your book, you say, the book emphasizes, it aims to win back the present for what you call historical time, and then you say, and thus it aims to win back historical time for politics. And I think it would be good to try and understand a little more with you before I come to my final question. What is the role you think that history does play or could play in revitalizing politics in engaging with the issues of our times? Yeah, thank you. That's, that, that's a wonderful question. Let me, let me start with why, one of the reasons why I think democracy is a good thing. Because, uh, it, 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 no, I mean, one of the things which is interesting about the present moment is that democracy now has to be defended. We, we can't simply say it's the only alternative. It's clearly not. And we can't say it defends itself because it clearly doesn't. We have to defend it. And if we're going to defend it, we have to have arguments which convince ourselves as well as convincing others, which means that this could be a moment of great interest in the public culture. And, and I hope it will be. But let me start with one argument for democracy, which is that democracy creates time. Democracy creates time. If, you have an, if you're in an authoritarian situation and you're ruled by somebody who's going to die and you don't know what's going to happen next, you don't think about the future. You're not encouraged to think about the future. Instead, you prefer to think, if you like him, that your leader is going to be timeless, that he's somehow outside of time. This is what the fascists explicitly said. The leader comes from outside of history and breaks the rule of time. He unifies us in a myth which is eternal, right? Therefore, don't worry about the fact that he's going to die at some point. Democracy gets us around the basic problem of politics, which is how do you keep your state going into the future? This is a really, really big deal. If you're in an authoritarian system, it's not just that you don't know what happens when the leader dies to the government. You don't know what happens when the leader dies to the state as a whole. The Russian leadership is very anxious about its own borders and about its own state, and it shares that anxiety with the rest of us. And these are the consequences that we feel. If you have a democracy, time moves forward. Because what democracy does is it allows you to vote for one person, blame your own mistakes on him or her, and then vote for somebody else the next time. That creates time in chunks of one year, two years, and four years. And, that, and, and the creation of time is incredibly important for human freedom. Because if you can't think about a political future, you also can't think about a human future, an individual future, or, or, or a family future. So, I mean, this brings me to what I think is so important about history. History reminds us that time is moving forward, <laughs> that it always has, and that if we are choosing ideas like inevitability, the idea that we're going to have progress, or like eternity, the idea that we only, all we have are cycles of doom, we are making choices inside history. We are choosing those ideas. We are choosing to accept those ideas. We are deciding that we don't want to be as free as we might otherwise be. History helps us to see those things as ideas. It helps us to get our minds around them and therefore helps us to get ourselves, our lives around them. It helps us to, it helps us to escape them. But then the other thing that history does is that history reminds us that, and this is the thing that I personally find so valuable, history reminds us that people who are smarter than we are have faced greater difficulties before, and lo and behold, they wrote about it, <laughs> and we can read what they wrote. And whether it's Czechoslovakia in the 1970s and its media politics, which in so many ways is similar to our own, or whether it's early fascism and the idea of the myth of the leader who comes from outside of time, there are things in the 20th century which, although they're not exactly like the present, people who lived through them wrote things and this is the thing I find so remarkable, not for themselves, they wrote them for us. But if we don't believe in history, we don't have that, right? If we don't see ourselves as connected to all that, we don't have that. And the final thing that I would say about history is that history gives you, it makes possible what I call in the book, the politics of, of responsibility. If you have history, you have a sense of structure, which means you know that there are limits. But if you have history, you also have a sense of agency. That is, if seeing structure isn't only about seeing constraints, once you see a structure, you also see how you can move around 
within it, right? Seeing structure is a precondition for understanding your own power, your own responsibility. And once you have done that, then it's up to you to decide whether to be free or not. So in these ways, I think, I think history can do an awful lot for us. The other thing that I love about history is that we're all historians, right? I'm not going to claim that we're all physicists, right? My brother is a physicist. I know that we're not all physicists. I'm not going to claim that we're all medical doctors, right? You know, that's the kind of thing that Mr. Trump would say. But I will say that we are all historians. We all live in history. We all make judgments about the past. We all use primary sources. We're just better and worse historians. I want us to be slightly better historians. I think that would make a big difference. My last question. I just want to pick up on what you said about the politics of responsibility. Because the question I asked myself by listening to you was, what kind of institutions do we need to think about? What kinds of institutions did we need to redesign if we want a politics of uh, responsibility um, as an alternative to both a politics of inevitability and the politics of eternity? How do you think one could bring back political virtues in uh, the age of politics contaminated so much by the internet as you've described it in the book? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's a very important question, and it's the question that I'm trying to write about right now. That is, how do we not just play defense, but how do we think of something new? I think it's the essential question in two ways. It's the essential question because it's the question that we have learned not to ask. One of the things which is very, very striking about the present moment, and I'm also talking to you all, young people, one of the things that I'm very, very striking about the present moment is the almost complete vacuum of normativity, the almost complete vacuum of ideas about what the good is, the shame that we feel almost in talking about the good, the moral relativism which accompanies the epistemic relativism. Again, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you what is good, but I am going to suggest that some things are good and that some things are better than others and that we can't really do without an ethical sensibility. And practically, we can't do without an ethical sensibility because without ethics, you can't think about the future, right? Without ethics, you are stuck in inevitability or you're stuck in eternity because inevitability and eternity are machines that produce ethics for you. Inevitability says there's going to be progress. There's going to be more of the good things we have now. So you don't have to ask what's good. Eternity says you are just victims of those outsiders. Therefore, you're good. And so if you're good because you're innocent, you don't have to ask what's good. But in order to think a better, a more democratic future, you have to make a commitment to what you think a good thing actually would be. And I, and this is the second thing, I, I, it's stunning given the unbelievable wealth that we collectively have, given the unbelievable technology that we have. We are living in a world that was unanticipated by most of the science fiction of the 20th century, right? Given that, how unbelievably impoverished our discussion of what to do with that wealth and that technology actually is, which is partly a problem of the wealth and its concentration. Because what happens when wealth is highly concentrated is that you have to listen to the billionaires and their ideas of the future, which are things like, let's go to Mars, let's build an island in the Pacific. Uh, these are not good ideas, people, is what I'm trying to say. These ideas are not going to work, right? But they take up a lot of space in the culture because we have to listen to the billionaires. And we have to say, oh, yes, that's very reasonable what you say about Mars because my university could really use some of your money, right? We have to, we have, we have to do that. And the technology is also taking us away from the normative, because you see, the time we spend on the internet is time which drives us generally back towards our psychological predispositions and away from the part of our mind that thinks about what's good. This is happening, right? There's a, there, the, 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 the machines make it very hard for us to think about what's good because they make it very easy for us to feel what seems right to us, which is an entirely different animal. So both the wealth and the machines are making it harder for us to think about the future. So I do have, I do have some ideas, right? I'm just, I'm, I'm only going to mention, I'm only going to mention one, which is the production 
of factuality. I think this is one that we simply cannot do without. It's very easy to fill up what the Russians nicely call the information space with lies and illusions, um, with, with fantasies about masculinity or about threat. It's very easy to take a day and spend it in front of a screen, right? These things are very easy. What Western, or what I should say Anglo-Saxon political thought has always said from Milton through Mill to the present is, so long as you have enough stuff out there in the information space, the truth will always emerge. That is hideously and empirically wrong. That is not true, right? In order for the truth to emerge, facts have to be produced. And the people who produce facts are the investigative journalists. And so countries who care about democracy and also countries who care about preserving their own sovereignty are going to have to find ways of investing in the production of factuality. And I mean that in, the, in a very simple sense. People understandably believe factuality when it comes from other people who they know. When they don't know journalists, the media becomes an abstraction and they don't trust it. And that is perfectly understandable, by the way. Um, and this is why I was dead serious when I said in 2008, we should have bailed out the newspapers. We should have bailed out the newspapers. It would have been so easy and so cheap in the US to bail out the newspapers and we didn't, but it's not too late. We, if we want to have democracy in the senses that we're talking about, we have to be able to fill up some of this space with new facts every day, not retweets, not sharing things which somebody in some other country invented, but actual people who are employed producing things. And I, the, the, the idea of production, I think, is ever more important as we move away from a world of physical production. Since we're moving away from a world of physical production into a world of symbolic production, we have to think hard at the beginning about what kinds of symbols we want to produce. My argument would be a very simple one. We should be producing symbols that convey everyday factual reality that help people make sense of their own lives. If they have that, I think democracy will then make more sense to them. Thank you very, very much, Tim, for this wide-ranging conversation. Uh, tomorrow evening uh, at the IWM, um, I would like to invite all of you, but I don't think we can accommodate all of you, unfortunately. But that is our topic, the power and the powerlessness of the media. Uh, and uh, that will be the next event in the Vienna Humanities Festival, which the IWM uh, hosts together with Time for Talk and the Wien Museum. I would like to thank very much uh, the organizers here uh, this evening for having us uh, here as the Wiener Vorlesung, and I would like to give the word to Lisa Nimmerfull. Thank you so much, Professor Snyder, for your inspiring lectures. Thank you. Vielen Dank für das interessante Gespräch, Rektorin Randeria, über den Weg in die Unfreiheit oder wie wir in uns hoffentlich selbst verbauen. Dabei kommt es letztlich auf jede und jeden Einzelnen an oder um es mit einem antiken Historiker, einem der Klassiker der Geschichtsschreibung, nämlich Thukydides, zu sagen, alles Große wird durch die Einwirkung eines Einzelnen vollbracht. Und vielleicht oder ganz sicher sind Veranstaltungen wie die Wiener Vorlesungen oder das Humanities Festival ganz gute Gelegenheiten, um gemeinsam Feuermauern oder Barrikaden gegen die drohende Unfreiheit aufzustellen. Die schlecht... Professor Snyder wird noch eine Zeit lang da sein. Er hat jetzt kein Buch zum Signieren, sondern etwas bekommen. Ich war bei der, bei der Unfreiheit, die schleicht sich gern leise heran und tarnt sich auch gut. Und auch dafür hatte Thukydides einen guten Ratschlag. Er meinte nämlich, leichtsinnig sind die meisten bei der Erforschung der Wahrheit und geben sich mit den ersten und besten Nachrichten zufrieden. Das sollten wir nicht tun. Wer Timothy Snyders Bücher liest, wird sehen, dass die Erforschung der Wahrheit einen langen Atem braucht und Beharrlichkeit, vor allem aber auch Bewusstsein. Denn 
die Welt ist aus den, aus den Fugen, bleiben wir also wachsam. Ich danke Ihnen fürs Kommen, fürs Zuhören. Wenn Sie Lust auf noch mehr von Timothy Snyder bekommen haben, dann können Sie, wie schon am Anfang gesagt, sein Buch draußen vor dem Festsaal kaufen. Er wird es jetzt signieren. Ich darf Ihnen die nächste Wiener Vorlesung auch schon ankündigen. Die findet am 22. Oktober dann im Radio Kulturhaus statt. Sie wird der Neugier in der Wissenschaft gewidmet sein und junge Forscherinnen und Forscher zu Wort kommen lassen. Falls Sie noch keine Pläne für morgen oder für das Wochenende haben, sei noch einmal an das Humanities Festival erinnert. Sie können, wenn Sie mögen, den urbanen Salon, der rund um den Karlsplatz an verschiedenen Stationen äh, stattfinden wird, bei freiem Eintritt äh, verschiedenste Veranstaltungen aus unterschiedlichen Perspektiven zum Thema Macht und Ohnmacht besuchen. Und bevor ich Sie nun verabschieden darf, noch ein kleiner organisatorischer Hinweis. Falls Sie eines der Headsets benutzen, nutzt haben für die Übersetzung, dann bitte denken Sie dran, es draußen wieder abzugeben. Für Sie wäre es zu Hause nur ein unnützer Staubfänger, der herumliegt. Hier aber kann er bei einer der nächsten Veranstaltungen für jemand anderen wertvolle Dienste leisten. Ich wünsche Ihnen noch einen schönen Abend. Kommen Sie gut nach Hause. Alles Gute. Auf Wiedersehen. Dankeschön. Danke.